Hey, this is John C. Hopkins from Mexico Word of Life. I want to tell you about a new show that we're announcing called Mexico Word of Life Ministries. Life for most seems aimless, uncertain, and cold, but we're here to tell you about God's love, how he can lead and guide you into real truth. This truth reaches the highest level of enlightenment, soothes all doubts, and calms all fears. Many today believe that God is dead, and if he was alive, he's indifferent to your needs. This is hardly the case. God loves you, and if you will receive the message of his son, Jesus Christ, you will never be the same. Don't be confused. The journey of life with the Lord is not a bed of roses, but one of excitement, power, and struggle. This show will provide you with excellent teachings on how you can live life without fear and have complete trust in God. The key is that you don't give up. If you can endure until completion, you will receive a reward that no eye has ever seen and ear has not even heard. Come join us. You will never be the same. First, I would like to give honor <clears throat> to my Lord and Savior. <laughs> to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and um, <clears throat> to my youth pastor, Timothy Hopkins. And can we give them all in our audience a hand clap? As always, thank you for tuning in to our podcasts and videos and on all social media. We appreciate that. <clears throat> Today I'm going to be talking about trusting God. And I'll be using uh, the book of Ruth, as well as other aspects of the Bible, showing examples of how to trust God, how to lean on Him, and how to depend on Him. Ruth is a beautiful book that shows us friendship, love, and companionship. These three key points I've named are the aspects of God. <clears throat> Friendship with God means having a beautiful intimacy with Him that goes beyond words. When you are a friend of God, you long to be in His presence, putting Him above all else. Making time for Him, loving His presence. When you have this type of relationship with God, longing for him, trusting him, <clears throat> loving him. He knows what you want before you ask. He knows your hurts when you don't know what else to do or don't know what else, you know, to say. He knows your pain because he's God, you know, he created us. He knows everything. And then there is the other beautiful part with God, love. Mom had a song she liked, falling in love with Jesus. And falling in love with him is so beautiful. But what does it mean <clears throat> to love God? To love God is to worship and praise him, to tell him how awesome he is, to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. That is the number one commandment of God, loving. God's love is unbreakable. Loving him the same way strengthens our love and relationship with him. Where things don't work out in life and you don't know what else to do, that's when you become closer to God, leaning on him more, trusting him more. You have to have a yearning for the Lord. As it says in Psalm 73 and 25, earth has nothing I desire besides you. To love God is to long for Him and to seek right standing with God, thus giving us peace. And you know God, <coughs> excuse me, when you know God, you can't get enough of Him. Once we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, we yearn for His presence more. Loving the Lord is more desirable than gold, even the finest gold. It is sweeter than honey, even honey dripping from the comb. When you love the Lord and don't have peace, he will give it to you because his peace surpasses all understanding. When you have a good relationship with God, he blesses you with freedom because <clears throat> remember, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Always remember God wants you to be free of bondage. 
He wants you to be free of worry. That's why you need to read the Word of God so He can make you worry free. <laughs> of course, you know, there's no way around um, life's problems. It's going to come. The devil's out there. You, you always got to fight. But if you have God, He'll give you peace and He will shoulder your burden. Because remember, Jesus said, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, after that introduction, we can go to the book of Ruth. And I, I love this book. Mom told me when I was a little girl, she used to read it to me. It was the first love story. <laughs> it's a really good story. But <clears throat> with the book of Ruth, it shows us so many things in just a few chapters written. It shows faith and trust. It shows faith when Ruth followed Naomi and a God she didn't know and following her to a path unknown. It shows trust because unconsciously, Ruth was just trusting God to work things out, even though the situation was bleak. You know, as we walk through life and knowing God for ourselves, you really learn to trust Him through the tough times when it seems like there's no hope. When it seems like darkness is won and the devil's defeated you, but how many know God is the light of the world? He truly brings joy in the morning. And when you're going through, you learn to say, the Lord will make a way somehow. That's what my mom always said when I was younger. Every time things were getting tight, you know, my mom always said, the Lord will make a way somehow. And you know the Lord honored her and her faith each time? He always pulled through making the impossible possible. There's one, well, there's one of many things good about God, but one in particular, he'll never fail you. He'll never leave you, because when God makes a promise, he'll never break it. That's how big our God is. He's not like us. We break our promises because we're human. We are a flawed race, imperfect, but God's perfect. He said himself he cannot lie, and he will always fulfill his promises. Recently, it wasn't funny then, but it is now. Recently, I accidentally made a purchase, and it took out some bill money. <laughs> the bill had to come out the next day, <clears throat> and I needed that refund immediately. So I called the company. They told me I wouldn't get the refund for like three days. I'm like, that's not working. As my brother would say, that is unacceptable. <laughs> so I was worried. I didn't know what to do. So I prayed about it. And then the Lord told me to fast. So I fast, but I was still worried. You know, understandable. You need the money, pay the bill. So the Lord gave me peace and he helped me fall asleep. Yeah, beautiful. When you love God, he help you go sleep too. <laughs> That's somewhere in Psalms. I forgot where that is. He uh, gives you peace and help you go to sleep. Yeah, beautiful sleep. So the next day I checked my account and saw the money still wasn't there. So I was like, you know, we got to make some phone calls. Okay? So I did that. But let's add some word of God with this, shall we? First I did my part. I prayed, I fasted, and I acted again. Because Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. And I did just that. I asked the Lord for help. I seeked by calling the company for my refund. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did, and guess what? I got my blessing, but it didn't come that quick. As remember, we have a, a devil out there that'll fight you, even to get your refund money. You're like, really? Leave me alone. So, I bind and I rebuke the devil and his demons to take his hands off my money because he's fighting me. He wants to take your blessing. So I fought back with the word of God. Our spiritual weapons. That's the only way to fight the devil is with the word of God. Physical weapons cannot hurt him because he is a spiritual being. So you need spiritual weapons. That's where God's word comes in. Remember um, 
in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, if you'll please turn there. The uh, 12th verse, <clears throat> it reads, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in spirit, all prayer, and with all prayer and supplication. Now, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, in this we pass to the one offensive weapon of the Christian. The sword of the Spirit, given by the Holy Spirit, which, like the helmet, but unlike the rest of the defensive armor, does not become a part of himself, but is absolutely of God. The passage reminds us at once of Hebrews, the fourth chapter in the 12th verse, where it says, the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Isn't that beautiful? Praise the Lord. But there, the original word is the larger and deeper word, logos, signifying the truth of God in itself, and gradually leading up to the ultimate sense in which our Lord himself is the word of God, Amen. revealing the Godhead to man. This is why it is important to always pray. Prayer is our greatest weapon because prayer will protect you. Prayer really does change things. Amen. Even if you're in a bad situation right now, if you know God, he will help you in that situation and help you get out. That's why it's important to have a relationship with God. Now, after I prayed and I fought the devil, I got the victory. Amen. My money was returned and I was able to pay my bill. Isn't that beautiful? That just blessing. Now, as a reminder, <clears throat> all this happened overnight. And that's all. The Lord gave me an overnight blessing, and I am sharing my experience with you guys to say this. God is getting ready to bless you and give you an overnight blessing. God is saying, I have seen you crying in the night, not knowing what else to do, tossing and turning. But in your anguish, I'm about to bless you, giving you your heart's desire, something you've been believing for for a while, and I'm about to give it to you overnight. Sometimes in our faith walk with God, we stumble on the road because, you know, life gets us down. We get tired of fighting the devil. Uh -huh. We don't want to read no more. It's hard trusting God because, you know, like, nothing happening. But that's all right. God helps us out. Amen. He gives us hope. When we waver in our faith, God picks us up, telling us we can make it. We can press on towards our mark because he gives us strength. Remember, God's strength is made perfect. Uh -huh. He makes us strong when we can't go on any further because he is our comforter. When we fall, he picks us up, walking with us each step of the way. God gives us hope when the devil steals our joy. God gives us strength when we are weak. He gives us faith when we think all is lost. God said in Isaiah 40 and 31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. In the end, as Pop says, as we walk this uh, road called life, all we have is hope and faith. Amen. These two are the greatest gems God has given us because faith without works is dead and having no hope in God is truly the end. But having faith in God makes the impossible possible
because we trust in him to do the impossible. Having hope in God is trusting God. The feeling of expectation and a desire for things to happen. Faith and hope play hand in hand because they both mean trust, expectancy. Okay. And all this ties in with Ruth's story. Ruth's story is a tale of deliverance, redemption, faith, hope, and choice. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, decided to leave with his family from the land of promise, Bethlehem, due to famine. Now this famine was a judgment by God because his people did not listen to him and they were a little hard-headed. So he sent forth his judgment on them. Naomi's husband decided to go to a Gentile land, the land of Moab. It was forbidden by Jewish law to go there, but he did it anyway because he made his choice. The land of Moab was a fertile land, but though Moab was a fertile place, it was cursed by God. God said, a Moabite shall not enter the congregation of the Lord, even to the 10th generation. They were not allowed in the worship of the Lord because they were cursed. The Moabite people were born through an incestuous relationship. It goes back to the book of Genesis. After the fall of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and his daughters escaped to the hills outside of Zorah. And as it reads in Genesis, the 19th chapter, starting at the 30th verse, it reads, Now Lot went out of Zorah and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zorah. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there's not a man on uh, earth to come, to come into us after the matter of all the earth. Let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they uh, made their father drink wine that night, and the first one went and laid with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I laid last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. In the younger arose and lay with her father. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus, both of the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The descendants of Moab settled east of the Dead Sea. We see them as a great people, enemies of Israel. Now, though uh, Naomi's husband knew that this land was the land of his enemies and was cursed by God, he still went to live there anyway. His decision on leaving Bethlehem was not a good one. Naomi's husband was a Jewish man, honored the covenant promises of God. And while he tra traveled to the land of Moab, others stayed in Bethlehem to tough it out. He too should have stayed and trusted God but instead, he went to the land of his enemies. The land appeared to be a better place to live, but as the old saying goes, the grass isn't always as greener on the other side. Sometimes it's far worse than where you're at. After the death of Naomi's husband, she decided to stay there with her two sons who were married to Moabite women, which was forbidden by Jewish law. Naomi's sons, Malon and Chilion, their names uh, met puny and sickly and piney, or crybaby. In that time, people named their children by the circumstances they were in, or how their children were born. So her children might have been very sickly looking. So as more time passed, Naomi's uh, two sons died, leaving her with no one but her daughters-in-laws, enemies of Israel, 
Moabite women. So Naomi decided it was time for her to return home, and she and her two daughters-in-laws went on their way to return to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-laws, Return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, if you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. Then Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, will you therefore wait till they were grown? Will you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law and love, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi felt her situation was God's judgment on her life. Because of the mistakes coming to Moab, she said, the Lord had dealt bitterly with me and you had to suffer for it. She saw this as judgment against her by God. It was true. Uh, whenever we sin against God, sometimes we affect others and take people down with us because of the wrongs made. Naomi and her husband chose Moabite wives, a people committed to serving idol gods for their sons. And as a result of Naomi and her husband's actions, they were experiencing the outcomes of their sins. Naomi saw the consequences of her sins affecting the lives of her daughters-in-laws. Now getting back to the uh, 14th verse of the first chapter of Ruth, it reads, Then they lifted up their voices and wept, and Orpah, whose name means stiff neck, kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Now just to stick a pin there, Orpah promised to return with Naomi, yet once she gave her out, she gone. She's like, bye. <laughs> now the part where uh, Naomi told Ruth that your uh, sister-in-law has gone back to her people and gods, just to put emphasis on that, one of the gods of Moab, which was their main god, was named Chemosh. Chemosh was a fire god and the Moabites worshiped Chemosh by taking their infants to the statue, lighting its arms until it was red hot and placed their infants in its arms to be a living sacrifice to their gods. That is definitely not God. God don't want you to kill little people or anyone else. That's of the devil. Now while Oprah went her way, Ruth remained. And I liked how the Bible said Ruth clung to Naomi. This expression is showing loyalty and devo devotion. Unknowingly, Ruth was making a life-changing decision to stay because this decision would determine if Jesus Christ was to be born in Bethlehem. Remember that Ruth is the great-grandmother, if I don't have it right, it's probably three times great, <laughs> but the great-grandmother of David. And Jesus is also descended from Ruth and David, because, you know, it's that line going on. That's awesome. So because of Ruth's choice, Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem. And here's another tip. As Tim says, uh, Tim said, I'll give you a $20 free charge uh, re revelation. <laughs> Bethlehem means house of bread. And how ironic that Jesus, the bread of life, comes from this land. Isn't that awesome? As Tim says, I'll give that to you free of charge. How about that? <laughs> now continuing in the 16th verse of the uh, first chapter of Ruth, it reads, uh, Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. And I like this part. This is awesome. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, 
I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Ruth's decision had spiritual implications. Her confession of faith, your people shall be my people, and your God my God, recalls the central covenant promise. I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Now the part, may the Lord do so to me, and more also. Ruth was binding herself by an oath that invites punishment if she's unfaithful. She swears this oath in the name of Yahweh, thereby owning him as her God. Now, isn't that awesome? She didn't even know him, and she wanted to own him as her God. Isn't that awesome? Ruth had good heart. You know, she I. Plus, she's really cool because my mom's middle name's Ruth, so boom. <laughs> Mic drop. I would do it if it wasn't so loud, you know. <laughs> but um, this was a significant leap of faith for Ruth. Her home was Moab, a land that she was familiar with. Yet she decided to leave her home, family, and gods to follow the true and the living God, the God of heaven, the God of Israel. This shows you Ruth's loyalty and commitment. Orpah chose to leave, cho chose to leave Ruth, uh, sorry, chose to leave Naomi, but Ruth remained. This reminds you um, of Mary and Martha. Uh, in the book of Luke, the uh, 10th chapter, the 38th verse to the 42nd verse, it's a good one. Um, See, what is it? it reads, um, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teachings. But Martha was distracted with uh, all the serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, don't you, uh, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. And in this instance, like with Ruth, Mary chose the better path. She sat at the Lord's feet, listening to every word Jesus said. When Jesus said Mary has chosen the good portion, this links with the Old Testament passages where the greatest possession is close fellowship with the Lord and at one's portion in life. Mary has chosen this and it will not be taken away from her, neither now to help Martha in the kitchen, nor for all eternity. And like Mary, Ruth chose the right path. She chose to serve the Lord and was rewarded in the end. If Orpah would have stayed, she could have been blessed too, but she chose to go back to her gods. Ruth showed Naomi she was a true friend, and Naomi needed a friend. And the same is true for all of us. We all need good friends, true friends. Friends that don't put your business out on the street, but you know, someone to stand by you when no one else will, someone to build you up when you're down, someone like Ruth. Finding a good friend is hard to come by, but if you do have that kind of friend, cherish them because they are a blessing from the Lord. And Ruth was a blessing to Naomi because she was that type of friend. And for now, I will stop here and pick up next time. But if you would like to accept Jesus Christ in your heart, say, Dear Heavenly Father, I am a sinner. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe Jesus Christ died and rose again. Come live in my heart, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And remember that the words that I speak unto you.